lecture. Afterwards, when I was having discussions with people, it turned out that people were quite confused about what on meant by this symbol, zero plus and zero minus. I thought it was rather elementary, but there seems to be a lot of confusion, so I'm going to spend some time describing this. See, what is going on, the misconception seems to be that I gave an example of a harmonic oscillator with some frequency, which becomes time dependent, and then it does all kinds of things and uh, goes to some other frequency. So, the, uh, the idea seems to be that if it went back to the same frequency, then these two things are the same kind of thing. No, it is not. Okay, so let me try to explain to you what is meant here. First, let us just look at a harmonic oscillator with a time dependent frequency in the manner which you are most uh, familiar with, Schrodinger equation. So I am talking about a Schrodinger equation with a time dependent frequency. So I will have some equation like I psi tau is equal to H psi. Okay. H will be the uh, standard harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian with the omega at equals omega of t. Okay? So this is a time dependent differential equation. It depends on time and space. I have to give psi at t is equal to let us say minus infinity or some we will say it goes from t1 to t2. At t is equal to t1 is when the time dependence is switched out. At t is equal to t1 I have to give you this sign. Suppose I say that psi is equal to the ground state T s at T is equal to T or T1. Okay, at an initial time, this is the initial condition which I am specifying, and then I am evolving it. Once I have given this initial condition, since it is a first order differential equation, I have no further control. It will just evolve. And my omega of T, I start with a value omega 1. Then it does all kinds of things, and at some t is equal to t2, it becomes constant again. Okay? It may become constant at the same value omega 1, it may become constant at a different value. It does not matter. Once this time dependent has taken place, and at t is equal to t2, if I look at psi, so the psi of let us say q at time t2 will be something which comes out of the solution to the differential equation, which I can expand in terms of the eigenfunctions phi n. Evaluate it, let us say at the t is equal to t1. At t is equal to t1 or before that, there was a whole lot of ground state, extra first excited state, etc. This forms a complete basis. And in terms of them, I can expand this. Now, in particular, I can calculate what is c0 square or C0, so to speak. Okay, L me you can C0 square. <coughs> this quantity gives the probability that the system which I originally started in the ground state, at t is equal to t1, it was in the ground state. So it was at n is equal to 0 state here. And then at very late time, it has gone into some state which I again expand in the complete basis. This number will be less than 1. This is what is being captured by this. This plus and minus etc. are just notations. Okay? So it is not that if the harmonic oscillator went through all kinds of jiggling and finally ended up with the same frequency. Of course, right now if you look at the states, ground state will be half x cross omega, f first excited state will be that plus x cross omega etc. But that doesn't mean that your quantum state is going to go from one ground state to another ground state. Okay? That is because you are integrating a time dependent equation. In terms of uh, Heisenberg picture operator, it is much nicer and it uses a concept called Bogolibo transformation, which uh, I originally thought I won't introduce, but because of all this confusion, let me try to introduce that. What happens there is the following. If you look at the standard harmonic oscillator, you have the variable q, which you write as 1 over root 2 omega, some a e to the minus i omega t plus a dagger e to the i omega t. 
Whatever it is, once I have specified this, I have again no control on this system. Dynamics decides for me what f of t will be at late time. In general, we know that since this is going to satisfy this equation with a constant omega at late time, it will be a superposition of e to the minus i omega t and e to the plus y. Right? This is like a scattering problem. If you think of this instead of t in terms of x, this is like uh, this will be like a potential, and t is equal to minus infinity is like coming a wave coming from the left. Then it gets scattered. There will be part which will be transmitted and part which will be reflected. So when you do the scattering problem, so you have an incoming wave. Then there is a transmitted wave and a reflected wave. So on the right side, you would think of it as something which is going and something else which is coming back. Okay. So at late times. You will have the q of t which is expanded in this form, where your f of t will have a e to the minus i omega t bar and a e to the plus i omega t bar. Now, if you your creation and annihilation operators are always defined as the coefficients of e to the minus i omega t and e to the plus i omega t. Okay, that is how you define your vacuum structure. As a result of it, your a's are going to become linear combinations of the original. So in general, what will happen is that at late times you will have a a which will be some alpha times the original a plus beta times a diagonal. Similarly, for a diagonal, which will be alpha star a diagonal plus beta star. A. Now your a and a diagonal will satisfy the same commutation rules as your small a and small a diagonal, provided alpha and beta satisfy the condition mod alpha square minus mod beta square is equal to one. This is, some of these I'm going to throw in as an exercise for you to work out, but this is fairly easy to do. So what does that mean? What it means is that your original a and a diagonal. Has gone into some other a and a diagonal, and that also satisfies the same commutation rules. So now you can define your particles, vector state, one particle state, etc. Everything using this a and a diagonal as well, just as the previous one. And this is something which is used in condensed matter very extensively. So when you do that, you can also compute. What the number operator is and what is its expectation value in different states. So let us concentrate on one particular aspect, namely the vacuum state. Originally, I would have defined A acting on some state in the Hilbert space as then just a symbol. You choose some state which is annihilated by A and you call it the in vacuum or vacuum at t is equal to minus infinity. Now at very late times. I can define another state, which is capital A acting on that state, is equal to zero. Okay. No, this is not going to be annihilated by A, and this is not going to be annihilated by capital A. These are two separate states. What is being computed is this one. Okay. So if you have this, there is a nice way of writing this as a kind of a unitary transformation, etc., and you can compute it. In particular. What you will find is that if I look at a diagonal a expectation value in this vector, if it was small a diagonal a, it is identically zero because the original is there were no particles. Now what will happen is that this a acting on this vector state, that a has this. Alpha is not going to contribute because this annihilates it. So I will pick up a beta. Then I have an a dagger on this. That will produce a one particle state. Then similarly, when that one particle state has to be annihilated by a dagger, that can happen from this. Therefore, you will pick up another beta star. This is more beta. Star. Okay. 
So the number of particles, so at late times you have some other harmonic oscillator with capital A and capital A dagger acting as the creation and annihilation operators. Now you say that originally, we are now talking Heisenberg picture. In Heisenberg picture, you start the system off in this state. Okay, so the state doesn't change, the system is in that state. But at late times, your interpretation of what is a vacuum state has changed. Because at late times you are thinking of a harmonic oscillator with capital E as the annihilation operator. Therefore, your number operator, the kind of particles you are thinking of, and the number operator is capital A dagger. Now you can say, okay, how many particles have I got? Well, I want to know how many particles I have got in the state in which the system is. State in which the system is never changes in Heisenberg picture. So you complete this completely. And you will find that the number of particles is not zero. So the particles have been produced in this process. Okay. So this is the way you work. And the system which we are studying is extraordinarily elementary. It is an exactly solved case where there is an <coughs> external JFT coupled to the harmonic oscillator. So as I said, I will give it as an assignment. You can solve the equations for F trivially. As a result of it, you can find what A and A dagger is. You will find that it just gets shifted. But shifting is not trivial. If A goes to A acting on something is 0, A plus some constant will not uh, annihilate it. Therefore, that shifting has to be interpreted in terms of particle production. You have to find out what it does and then compute this whole thing and you will find that there is a particle production. So this is what is, and in, in the whole discussion, we never asked about what is the final frequency with respect to the initial frequency. It can be different, it can be the same. But what is important is that the evolution mixes up the positive and negative frequency. Okay? So I hope that is clear. Yeah. Can you have one question? Uh, what about conservation of energy? What is the conservation Oh, of whenever there is an external source, that source has to supply the energy for producing the particles. Yes, but as we are summing over all moment, all, all energy states. So we are not summing over all energy states in, in the sense of uh, uh, no, no. We, when we return three particle propagators as in, uh, in then uh, we find out like right. and we integrate it over all k states. K in terms of momentum k? Yeah, or energy k yeah, because three particle. No, that is, that is the part which you have to be careful. In determining the propagator, you may integrate over anything you like. But the moment there is an external JFX which is coupled to the harmonic oscillator all the harmonic oscillators or whatever, this JFX does not conserve energy. That is, if you look at the Hamiltonian for this system, if there is an external JFX which depends on time, that will not conserve energy, because the Hamiltonian is no longer conserved. So that J is what is supplying the energy for producing this part. Okay. Fine. This is one point. Then there is also one minor uh, typo which I wanted to correct. I mean, since I knew the result, I got the correct result, but the, there was a typo in the analysis which was pointed out to me later on. This has to do with the form of that yes. So let me just go over it so that uh, someone who is not reading the notes but watching the videos will get it corrected at least in the second video. See, we had this quantity S of T X, which we showed was equal to phi over right d omega p e to the minus i p x which is i omega t plus i p dot x. This we proved for t greater than 0. Then I wanted to know what it is for t less than 0. Therefore, I said let us look at s at some minus modulus of t. Okay. Now, now I am talking about t which is less than 0 and is equal to minus modulus of t. So that uh, modulus of t is actually minus t. This is what I am looking at. There I wrote this with just x. I should have actually said that put x because the symmetry says that you change t and x to minus t and minus x. So this quantity we know is equal to because of the symmetry of this t modulus of x. Okay. So what I wanted was for this quantity. 
because I knew this for t greater than 0, I wanted it for t less than 0. Therefore, this should be mapped to this quantity. Okay. Now, what is this? This is going to be integral d omega p e to the minus i omega modulus of t. Just plug it into that because this is now positive time, so I know the expression. <coughs> and minus i p dot x because this x becomes minus x. Then we know that modulus of t is minus t here, so I replace it by minus t. So this is going to So this is what we found. This is equal to integral d omega p e to the i p x. Okay. I mean, because the p sign didn't matter, I flipped it at uh, at the second step. But this is this is the correct logic in order to get this. This is the answer which we got. Okay. Fine. Now we will proceed further. And we want to extract some physics out of the expressions which we had. Okay, let me, this should be enough. I don't have to raise it now. Okay. So, what we want to do next is to understand the structure of this quantity which we have found, namely 0 plus 0 minus, which we wrote as exponential minus half integral dx. It is, let me call it uh, uh, dx uh, dxy j at x x y j at y. We wanted to extract various uh, applications of this formula and there are some very cute things which happen with this. One which is rather obvious and the other one which is highly non-trivial. So let me do the obvious one first. The obvious one is that we want to compute what is the mod square of this. Okay, just to see what is the particle production which is happening. What is the probability that the ground state remains the ground state? And we should find the probability first of all to be less than 1. If it becomes greater than 1, we are in trouble. And it is not obvious from this what it is going to be. I can write it as exponential minus something, but it is a complex number. So you have to compute the mod square and convince yourself is less than 1. So, if I do the algebra right, it will turn out to be less than 1. So, let us calculate that. So, I want 0 plus 0 minus mod square. And there are various ways of doing this. One way of doing this is to write this in momentum representation. If you write it in momentum representation, you will have 1 upon p square minus m square plus i epsilon. And there is a formula for 1 upon x plus i epsilon in terms of the principal value and the Dirac Calder function. And you can use that to obtain it. I will do it in a slightly more nitty gritty way and throw this in as an assignment. So let us compute this. This is exponential minus half integral dx dy jfx jfy. Then this quantity plus its complex conjugate, right? Because I am taking mod square, so I have to multiply this by its complex conjugate. So when I multiply it, the exponentials add, so this quantity plus its complex conjugate. So let us write this out. That is d omega p e to the minus of, uh, this requires a little bit more work. So what I am going to do here is to write this as d omega p. The first quantity is e to the i p dot x minus i omega p times modulus of t. That is what this quantity is. This is slightly bad notation, so let me change that into x1, x2, x1, x2 x2, x1, x1, so that I can use x for the other one, x, x, x2, x1, j at x2, j at x1. So this x and t now stands for x2 minus x1, or standard notation. This is uh, coming from this quantity, then I want to add to it its complex conjugate, which is e to the minus i p dot x plus i 
omega p of e. Okay. And I want to manipulate this quantity. So let us look at that. What will happen is that this is again the same expression exponential minus half integral two j's j at x2 j at x1 then in this I have an integral over d omega p first thing I do is that in the second one I can play the same trick p can be flipped so I get e to the i p dot x outside then I have e to the minus i omega p modulus of t plus e to the i omega p modulus of t. In this I will claim that I can just re remove the modulus of t. Okay? If it is not obvious, let us look at this. What is this stand for? It stands for theta of t e to the minus i omega p t plus theta of minus t e to the i omega p t I will drop this p this is what this quantity is and the second quantity which I am writing is complex quantity of that that is theta of t e to the i omega t plus theta of minus t e to the minus i omega t now let us look at e to the i omega t there is a e to the i omega t here and e to the min uh, i omega t here this is multiplied by theta of t and the theta of minus t right so this is e to the i omega t to theta of t plus theta of minus t that means theta of t plays no more it is one order work okay so that will just become e to the i omega t similarly this is going to become just e to the minus i omega t therefore in this I can just remove this modular sign Fine. So once I have removed the modular sign, I will bring this back in. I will bring this back here also. And in the second one, I will again change p to minus p. That means this is going to become p e to the minus i p x. Plus e to the i p x. Now what is x? x is x2 minus x1. So this is x2 minus x1. And if I change x2 and x1, I get this. So this is just a symmetric contribution. <coughs> of this. Right? So both of these are going to, because it is symmetric, whatever is this is contributing is the same thing with this is contributing. So I can retain just one of them and remove that half. So that gives me e to the minus i p x and this goes now is the time to bring back d x 1 and d x 2 here and here I will write this as x 2 minus x 1 so this is easy because this is going to be exponential minus integral over d omega p that reminds so x1 integral, x2 integral is e to the minus i p x2 of j of x2. Now the signs really don't matter. That is some g j of p. The other one is going to be star of that. <coughs> so you end up getting mod j. Let me write this explicitly now. Omega p p square. That is you combine this with x2 and integrate over x2. Combine this x1 with x1, integrate over x1, keep this outside. Okay? Okay. First thing, this is this quantity is positive definite, so it is e to the minus a positive quantity, so it is less than 1. That is quite gratifying. You can actually do one more check on this. That is the following. Let us look at this expression in slightly greater detail. This is exponential minus integral d3p over 2 by d whole cube 
1 upon 2 omega p, I will call this jp square. This is just a shorthand notation for on shell value of this jp. This is, this is what we have got. Okay? But this entire sum which I have written down is in the original discrete version is nothing but exponential minus the summation over p and I can think of this as i j p into i j p star. Okay, I goes for a ride in complex conjugation and then there is a jp and the jp star. But this is what we had originally called minus the early term vacuum state to 1p. Right? So this is going to be exponential summation over p or rather I can now write it as a product over p for each one of them of exponential minus mod 1p vacuum square. This is a nice result. The reason it is nice is because we argued early on that all these processes we started out with a linear approximation where this exponential was just 1 plus some quantity. So this tells you in that limit that the plus minus ground states mod square in the leading order is 1 minus this quantity some over all p. It is I am just tailor expanding this quantity. 1p 0 minus mod square. This is a very important consistency check for the conservation of probability. Because when we worked it out to the linear order, we said that the intermediate states are only one particle states. And this gives the amplitude for a part, one particle of momentum P to be generated from the vacuum. This gives the probability that a particle with a momentum P is generated. The sum over all P tells you that the total probability for anything other than vacuum to have existed. 1 minus that gives you the probability that the vacuum existed at all. Okay. So, with numerical factors and everything, it turns out to be the nice thing. And the final vacuum to vacuum transient magnitude, you find is a product over every momentum. I mean, that is because there is no interaction. Each momentum acts independently. So, you latch on to any given momentum vector P, and then whatever you have got the result, you can multiply over all the momentum. So for that particular momentum vector P, the amplitude that no particle is produced at that momentum P is given by e to the minus mod square of this. Okay? And I told you earlier on that it is a Poisson statistics. So this is like the probability for something not to happen in Poisson is some e to the minus x bar. Because there is an x bar to the power n upon n factorial in the e to the minus x bar. And this is that x bar. So this actually tells you the mean number of particles produced with that momentum value p. So that has this expression here which is jp square upon 2 omega p. That is the mean uh, number of particles which are produced. The, then you of course sum over all the momentum particles. It is also important that particle production has to be an on-shell process. What do I mean by that? We started out with a j which was some arbitrary function of space and time that is uh, here when you write these things down you have a j which is j of t comma x you specified that j and then we did all this now if it is going to create a particle with a momentum p it should supply it an energy omega p you take the Fourier transform of this function when you do the Fourier transform, you have to have a non-zero value for this. Correct? 
Now this is a strong constraint on the form of the function. I mean, in general, an arbitrary function will have that. I mean, generically speaking, but you can choose functions in such a way that it does this particular value vanishes. That is, for a given p, the Fourier transform at that particular value of omega p is zero. In that case, that particular particle with that momentum p cannot be produced. Right? In particular, if you take the case where j is static, assume for a minute that j has no time dependence, then in its Fourier transform, all the j omega, there are no omega dependent except at zero frequency. So no particles can be produced. If you have a static source, this production will not take. That looks very gratifying and you would have thought that only time dependent uh, external uh, agencies can produce particles etc. Until we do it much later in electrodynamics where there is something called a Schoenger effect where you will find that even a, a static electric field can produce particles. Then we will all get confused and we will try to work out why that happens. Okay? But at least now things are all sensible. Only time dependent things on shelf is going to produce the particles and that is what is going. So if uh, you you do and that came up because we did these integrations over d omega p, which are all d three p integrations. Okay. Now this does not mean that if you have a static source, nothing happens. In fact, we will work out something for static source, and something beautiful will emerge out of it. But it cannot have mod square less than one. Okay. It can be a pure phase and that phase contains some important information which we will try to work out next. Okay. So let us, let us go. Sir, yeah. So there is only Taylor expanded. You did a Taylor expansion. Right. So higher order time. Yeah, the higher order time tells you multiple, the particle production taking place with large number of particles. Okay. So which is what we worked out yesterday. What we did was we took this. And I did a Taylor series expansion with all orders yesterday. So there I had i j p to the power n upon n factorial. And then I interpreted that n factorial with the root n factorial in one and root n factorial in the other. That gives you the amplitude <coughs> for in different momenta particles to be simultaneously present. What I am trying to point out, even then everything will work out correctly because there is a Poisson statistics and it will be normalized. What I am trying to point out is that our original derivation <coughs> sticking to just linear order must have satisfied this. I could have written it down by inspection, saying that to the lowest order this should hold. And that just suddenly takes place. If you take all the processes into account, then you will again find that the probability is conserved in the Poisson statistics because it is x to the n e to the minus x upon n factorial and the summation over n will give you 1. Yeah. And this is a statistical method? Or, uh, ah, okay. In the sense that whether you are asking whether it is some kind of a fluctuation or uh, what do you mean by statistical method? Statistical when you say that uh, that's, an that's the average value of uh, particles. Right. It's the momentum P. Right. So, uh, yeah, okay. In, it, it, is, it is a little tricky. What is meant here is that if I had this source switched on and then I do all these. The mean number of particles which will be produced is this. What do I mean by mean number? What is meant is that in a given configuration, if I start from a vacuum state and I say that I want a particular final configuration to emerge, by and large it will have a non-zero amplitude. Okay? But then you average over all of them and you say what is the number of particles which are produced with a momentum. So, in quantum mechanics, you always tell you that given a particular state, something is going to happen. But when you compute, or when you compute all these probabilities for any situation, there is some kind of an underlying averaging concept in quantum mechanics. It, in that sense, it is statistical. But it is not as though we have some external temperature or some statistical fluctuations in the temperature or anything. Uh, how will it help? How will? How will it help? I mean, uh, how will what help? How will that? This result has. No, there are situations where you may want to compute how many particles are produced in a given uh, situation. Okay, how much of energy has gone into that particles, etc. So then you can use that sort of thing. Okay, let me.
go further. The next case I want to evaluate it is for the situation where the J is static. Now, if J is strictly static, then you will find that there is some integrals which uh, diverge, etc., etc. You can immediately see there is a dt integral going on on that, and one of them will diverge. But that can be interpreted in a particular way. So, you can do it all very precisely by saying that it is not really static, but it is quasi static. And saying that what is the time scale over which it is varying and doing these things precisely. But I will not bother to do that. I will take the naive uh, approach where I will just assume it is static. But when finally the interpretation is required, we will bring that in. Okay? That is the spirit in which the calculation is going to be done. Okay. So let us look at that quantity. So I again have the vacuum to vacuum transition amplitude. Now I am going to study a static source. Therefore, it is a good idea to separate out time and space integrations. So I will retain the space integrations d3 x1, d3 x2. Then I have two time integrations to worry about. So that is d t1, d t2. These are from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. Then let us look at those expressions. Those expressions will okay, be let me write the j's of side because they are j are static. Uh, j's are static, so this is x1, j at uh, x2. Okay. Now let us look at the time integrations. There is a d t1 integral minus m plus infinity of d t2. Now all that is left is our propagator. So again we will write that propagator as uh, d omega p e to the i p dot x e to the minus i omega p modulus of p2 minus p1. Let us clean these things up a little bit. So I have an exponential minus half integral d3 x1 spatial d3 x2 spatial and we also keep that momentum integral here d omega p. Then I have j of x1, j of x2, and let me take that e to the i p also outside, e to the i p x2 minus x1. Okay. Then I have the time integrals here. So what I need to evaluate is integral dt1, dt2, e to the minus i omega p modulus of t2 minus t. Now again, I have to be careful with the signs. I know the final answer, so if the sign go wrong, you sort it. So this is the integral which I want to do. So it is good to change this measure dt1 dt2 to the t2 minus t1 and the average time. So what we are going to do is to introduce two quantities. Let us say capital T which is half of t1 plus t2 <coughs> and then small t or I will call it tau which is t2 minus t. The idea is that t1 is uh, capital T minus half tau, t2 is capital T plus half tau. So there is a capital T and then you go half tau before and half tau after. These are the two events which you are going to consider. 
And you can work out and show that the Jacobian is unity, so that this can be translated into stripe forward integrations on capital DT and data. This is then going to become modulus of tau. This is crucial. If it was not modulus, if it was e to the minus i omega p tau and you integrate over theta minus infinite plus infinity, you will get a Dirac delta function on omega p. And since we are talking about a static source, there is no way it can have a Fourier transform at that and it will just give you zero because omega p is a positive point. But it is not tau, it is the modulus of tau. Therefore, when you do this integral, you are going to get zero to infinity and a factor 2, which takes away this factor 2. Okay? And uh, since it is only positive, I can do this. And you do that integral. So that integral will give you only the lower bound is going to contribute. So there is a minus sign already is coming from that. Excuse yeah. me. So that part would uh, be very clear. I have minus infinity to plus <coughs> infinity e to the minus i omega modulus of tau. So since it is only modulus of tau, minus infinity to plus infinity integral can be written as minus infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity. So it is tau is 0 to infinity. 2 I cancelled out. And since it is positive, modulus of tau is tau. Okay. So only lower part is going to contribute. So there is a minus sign. Then it is 1 over minus i omega p. Just make sure I don't make an error in the sign and things like that. Okay, This is what I seem to get. So minus and minus goes away. Then I have 1 by i, that becomes minus and then i. This is what comes out of this. Then there is this dt integral from i. So your answer will become 0 plus 0 minus is going to be exponential. There is a minus i, so that minus and this minus will give me plus i. Then I will keep that integral minus infinity plus infinity dt right outside because this is a divergent integral. Okay. So I have taken care of everything here except for the omega p factor which we will come to. Then let us look at this quantity. So the remaining things are d3 x1 integral d3 x2. So j x1 j x2 Then I have an integral here. That integral is going to be integral over d3p upon 2 pi d4 cube 1 upon 2 omega p. That 2 omega p combines with this to give me 2 omega p square. Okay? Then I have uh, e to the i p dot x. I want to take this 2 and put it here. So this is what we have. You should be able to see it now. If you don't, let me work it out. What is this omega p square? This omega p square is just p square plus n square. So let me put it here. So what I am doing here is the Fourier transform of 1 upon p square plus m square with respect to x2 minus x1. This is a standard integral. I will leave you to work it out. That integral will give you, this particular thing will give you uh, 
uh, 1 upon 4 pi modulus of x2 minus x1 e to the minus m x2 minus x1. You must have done this. This is like a Yukawa potential. The Fourier transform of Yukawa potential is p squared plus m squared. If m goes to 0, this is 1 upon p squared Fourier transform is 1 upon x. This is the standard Coulomb's law kind of thing. This is what we need. So let me call, okay, so this quantity, let me call this minus v of x2 minus x1. The minus sign is chosen with some foresight. Okay. Therefore, this entire integral can be written as exponential minus i by 2. Okay. It can be written as exponential minus i integral dt minus infinity plus infinity of a quantity which I will call E, where that E is defined to be the rest of the things, which is minus, that minus is to compensate for this minus. So then I don't, I don't need this. Let me, let me just put it as we. Integral half, this half comes from this d3 x1 d3 x2 j of x1 v of x2 minus x1 or x1 minus x2 it only depends on the modulus j of x2 What does this mean? As I said, this is a beautiful result. So we had to spend some time understanding it. First thing which you notice is that this vacuum to vacuum amplitude can be expressed as exponential minus i integral dt of some t. Okay. So to begin with, it is a pure phase, okay. which is what it should be. Because we are looking at a static source, we don't want it to create any real particle. So all that happens is that over the evolution or which is pseudo evolution because nothing is present there, no time dependence is there, you are going to only pick up a pure phase. But the phases have important meaning in quantum mechanics and we have already saw when we did the path integral and took the asymptotic limit that the exponentials minus i et tells you that this can be interpreted as the energy of this. Okay. So, what is that energy? That energy turns out to be an interaction energy of the source or the self interaction energy of the source. So, you have one j at x2 and j at x1 <coughs> and the coupling is through a potential with a minus sign. The minus sign first of all tells you that the interaction is attracted. Okay. The currents j attract each other. And the force of attraction is given precisely, I mean potential for attraction is precisely given by the Yukawa potential. Now where did all this come from? All these came from this propagator. So you can now think of, I mean this is a qualitative picture which you have heard so many times. There is one particle which emits uh, some quantity, it is absorbed by the other one. As a result of the exchange of the quanta, there is a force of attraction between this is precise mathematical explanation for that in, in a particular context. So you can think of this source as emitting a particle which is again being absorbed by the other one. The entire process is virtual because there are no real particles which are produced or uh, uh, destroyed because you are talking about a static source. But this absorption and emission is is going to finally uh, finally influence the vacuum functional, the, the, the transition between the in and out state. 
in the form of an attraction energy. It manifests as an attraction energy, which is exactly the form which you would have written down qualitatively by thinking of a particle of mass m being exchanged. Because you know that if a particle of mass m is being exchanged, the range of the particle should be like h cross over mc, and that is precisely what this is telling you. So this is the way original Yukawa theory for pions, etc. were developed. Something was the pions were being exchanged as uh, spin zero scalar particles and that produced a force of attraction. This is what was done. And the beauty of this is that we started out the derivation of this result by talking about entirely on shell processes. Our starting point was this 1, 0 to 1 p which was written in terms of JP, where this P was on shell. Okay. Then you finally got an expression like this. Then we said, okay, now that we have got an expression, let us ask what happens off shell. When the JF exists uh, static, that is the worst off shell situation you can have. Okay. And it already contains an information about this. This has to do with some uh, fairly complicated issues like the analyticity in the complex plane for the Lorentz and Venian structures, etc, etc, which I won't go into. But when you do this calculation, this is what you get. You can of course make this a little bit more precise. When you do the integral, I mean you may wonder what is this dt doing? I mean dt is this a divergent integral because this yeah, e is not that. But you don't have to worry about it. What you actually should do is that when you do the integrals, you think of these in these integrals, evaluated at capital E with a t plus half tau and t minus half tau and that integration can be uh, expanded in a Taylor series. If the source has a particular size here and it is not varying at a time scale which is required for light to travel across that. Okay? So you have a source whose spatial extent is given by some length scale L. And there is a light travel time across that length scale. And if you are talking about processes where the source is not varying rapidly between the light can go from one end to the other end of the source, then the static approximation is valid. Then the E will have some kind of a weak dependence in T, so you don't have to uh, panic about a divergent integral. But even without that, these sort of things we will keep getting. I mean, we could have taken the logarithm, taken a time derivative, and then worked the whole thing out. You could have interpreted that as theorem. But what is remarkable is the way this result comes. It comes from 1 omega p in the denominator coming from Lorentz invariance because that integration d3p over 2 pi is equal to that and 1 over 2 omega p. Another omega p coming from an integration between the differences that together gives you an omega p square which is p square plus m square and then you do the so you couldn't have again guessed this because this omega p is combined because of two separate reasons, etc. etc. Having said that, there is one way to understand this in a purely non-relativistic quantum mechanical situation. So let me just explain that and I am not going to do the details of that, I will let you uh, handle that. Suppose you think of a harmonic oscillator with a constant force. As I said, the source B uh, producing things in the field theoretic context is equivalent to a harmonic oscillator with an f of t. But suppose you make uh, one more drastic assumption and say f of t is independent of t. So what we are talking about is a harmonic oscillator potential which was originally let us say half omega square q square and you add to it an f q. If f was time dependent, that would correspond to what we have been talking about in terms of j. So since we have a whole class of harmonic oscillator, maybe I should put a label k as well. And all these fk's are constant. But if fk's are constant, this is a trivial system because I can write this as half omega k square. Then I have a qk uh, plus fk by omega k square, the whole square, minus 
f k squared by omega k to the power 4. Let us make sure this is correct. If I square this, I first get q k square, which is fine. Then I get an f k square upon omega k to the power 4, which is cancelled out. Then I get a 2 q k f k upon omega k square. Omega k square cancels out, 2 cancels out, you get q k. Right? Now you think of this as a new variable, capital Q k. So this potential is just same frequency, count omega k square capital Q k square mm. with a very important extra term which is half f k square <coughs> upon omega k. This is the origin of 1 upon omega k square. What happens is that the harmonic oscillator with a constant uh, force fk is equivalent to another harmonic oscillator with the potential just shifted by this and when you do this as a homework assignment all the signs etc will work out fine. Because of this shifting your Hamiltonian gets shifted and every one of those energy levels get this shift. In particular the ground state for example picks up this shift. So this shift which is here if you integrate over all k that is sum over all the oscillators you will have to do the integral over all of these fk square and when you do that half factor and everything will work out fine and then fk will get replaced by jk which is the Fourier transform of j and in, in the integral you can write this as jfx jfx1 jfx2 and the Fourier transform of 1 over omega k square so in that sense it is not mysterious because you can actually see where it comes from but in the full context it is going to give you an interaction between a self interaction of the source and the, because it is self it is self interaction because of this factor half okay so if you have a one source and another source and they are coupled you will not have this factor half this half is taking care of this and this is standard electrostatics rho at x rho at y upon mode x minus y integrated that is the kind of interaction which we are talking about okay so not only that we have worked this out, we have also done a practical example of that which tells you how the forces are mediated by this. The minus sign here is also crucial. It tells you that if you have scalar fields mediating interactions, the force is attracted. That is the like charges in a scalar theory attract each other. You can repeat this entire calculation for electrodynamics. Then you will have a J mu, J mu here because you will have two currents and this uh, in between term or rather the in between term for oh, have a theta. The propagator which you write down will have an eta mu. And when you do the whole thing, you will find that the sign flips. Okay. So as a result of which in electromagnetism, the two, uh, the two light charges will ripple each other. Now, unfortunately, this is one problem with the signature I have chosen, plus, minus, minus, minus. If you do it the other way around, with the signature minus, plus, 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 then it turns out that all that matters is that you will have structures like J of X, J of Y, in the case of the scalar, you will end up having something like uh, J mu, actually I in my notation with the J A, J of X, j a of x y in the case of a vector where only the zeroth component is relevant so when you have the zeroth component here and the zeroth component here you will pick up a minus sign because one of them is lower of course the result is independent of the signature so you will pick up a minus sign anyway but in this case it is very easy to see at the next level suppose you have a spin 2 source this is spin 0 this is spin 1 and the spin so two source will have two indices. So there you will have something like J A B, J A B at X and at Y. And now you are lowering two zeros. So it will again be plus. So this source is usually denoted as D A B and that field is usually called gravity. And that is why gravity is attracted. So gravity is attractive, electromagnetism is repulsive, scalar will be attractive. 
And this has to do with the spin of the particles are more important than to this mathematical structure. They alternate. Okay? So this is exactly what is happening. And you can do exactly the same analysis as this. It's just that the maths is more complicated. Once you do that x2, x1 propagator for the theory, and you can figure out why electromagnetism is uh, like charges ripple, and in gravity, like charges attract. It is not mystery at all. From the field, once Lorentz invariance is brought in, and you say that all the fields have to carry, in some sense, the representations of the Lorentz group, and the spins are assigned to these fields, it follows from that result. Okay. So that is all that I wanted to do as far as this uh, uh, application of this result is concerned. Now we want to proceed further and connect up this result with the fields which we talked about. So I will do a little bit of preliminary thing now and then we will stop and then the rest of it we will do in the next lecture. Okay. Right. 
So uh, I just talked, yeah, okay, there is a factor 2 which is missing. That is because when I differentiate, it could be either from this or from this for a generic case. So there are two factors there. So this is what we have. This gives you the result that mxy which is our old friend propagator x2y has a completely new avatar now. This can be thought of as minus 1 by z d square z by djx dJy evaluated at j is equal to 0. Okay. This is some kind of a normalization, but essentially what we are saying is that if you differentiate this quantity twice with respect to the j, you are going to get the propagator. Okay. But on the other hand, we know that this propagator is also expressible as vacuum expectation value of a time ordered product of phi at x, again now discrete i, phi at y. We had phi dagger, but think of a real scalar field for a moment. Just for simplicity. Okay. This is all a motivational uh, part of the lecture in order to show you what I am going to do in the next class. So this xy is some kind of a mean value because this is an expectation value which I can think of it as a, some kind of a mean value of some object. Here we are finding that, that the same mean value is coming as a secondary value evaluated at j is equal to c. Okay. Now this should tell you something. The same thing happens in statistical mechanics and probability theory in terms of something known as generating function. So let me just uh, remind you of that. Suppose I have some probability distribution P of Q for a variable, continuum variable. And I take say e to the minus uh, lambda Q integral, let me think of it as uh, just pos uh, positive values of Q. This I call f of lambda. Right? Now suppose I wanted to compute, suppose I compute from this d square f by d lambda square evaluated at lambda equals 0. If I evaluate two derivatives of lambda, I will bring down two q's and then I am going to put lambda equals 0. So I would have got 0 to infinity q square p of q d. This is nothing but expectation value of q q, so to speak. So these probabilities are normalized, so there is no extra factors which come in there. But what it tells you is that if I have a p of q and I have evaluated this quantity as f of lambda, then two derivatives of that evaluated at that lambda equal to 0 gives you the expectation values of this. Right? Now, I would have played the same game with an i put here. Suppose I had done this and I had taken the Fourier transform. There are some convergence issues except for that it doesn't matter. So then I have to differentiate this with respect to i lambda twice. Okay? So if I differentiate with respect to i lambda twice, that is same as having a minus sign k and I would have got exactly the same result. This is precisely what is happening there. This f is like our z. This, so the correspondence is like this. f is like our uh, z. Lambda is like our j. And q is like our phi. So the expectation value of two of these quantities is given by minus some derivative except for a normalization. It is the derivative with respect to this quantity, which is what we are working out here. 
and that quantity is a meter di that that two times this quantity of a probability distribution. We started with this expression. The only difference is normally in statistical mechanics or probability theory, you will be given PFQ. Then you will do this Laplace transform or Fourier transform in order to get this f of lambda. Then using that you can calculate all the mean values. Fine. Here we started with this f of lambda because we arrived at that f of lambda in some way. This is z of g. The question we want to now ask is what is p of q? What is p of phi? In our case the q will become phi. What is p of phi? So how do we find that? You have to do an inverse Fourier transform because after all we know that if this is true then p of q is integral minus infinity plus infinity d lambda f of lambda into the i lambda q right in our case what should we do we have to do an integral over the j so take j at any point x then you have an z of this j this goes to this then you have a e to the i j at x phi at x summed over all x the, I could have done the same thing with the q1, q2, q3, qn with a multi-dimensional variable then I would have got lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda n that is what we are doing. I mean, I am assuming that you are a sufficiently mature audience for I not to have to expand it down. So, what is happening here is that this one lambda is now going to be replaced by j at every point, j at x, j at x prime, j at y, etc. So, there is a whole lot of j's there. Then, one integration over d lambda has to now become integration over x, y, z, all of them. And just as you had an i lambda q, I will have a jx and a phi x. We already know this quantity, which is written down there. Okay? So, if I do the integral, I will get what is this p of phi. Then, I do not need my j, I could have worked with just this probability distribution. I mean, suppose I want to compute moments, etc. We want to know what is the object of which I am calculating the moment. We will get this. This is another way to discover the fields. Because originally we had the propagator x2, x1. We stared at it very hard and then we found that it has fields inside it. In the sense that it could be interpreted in terms of harmonic oscillators and fields. Then we said, okay, let us forget path integrals and all that sort of a thing. Let us start from creation and annihilation of particles and work out the same thing. Then we found that the same propagator amplitude appears as an exponential minus of the j at x, j at y in between. Now I want to get the fields from this. That is why I wanted to go back and first get the propagator out of z of j. That I have done again. I have obtained the propagator from z of j by this formula. But I know that this propagator is also this quantity. This reminds me that this is maybe z of j is like a generating function. And if that is the case, by doing a Fourier transform on j, I will be able to get something which is related to the field. I do not know what it is yet, and this is what we will do next. So in the next lecture, we will do this uh, Fourier transform, rather the inverse Fourier transform, and use that to find out what this p of phi is. And that is essentially all that we need at this stage and then we will do the field theory in the standard way. Okay, that, then we will stop there. Uh, questions? I am not taking the class tomorrow. Uh, so we will meet next week. Any questions? Come. So, uh, when you did this uh, static source. Yes. And you, and you were not thinking about fields at that stage. I was not talking about fields right, at so that stage. You were saying that, uh, and so the situation that I have also. I was just trying to think of the right. so. so it's like suppose I have some static, some like, it's like saying that I have some current which right. is uh, complete, I mean which is not changing with time at all. all right. And uh, I mean I'm just trying to think of the equivalent in say like for example. Like in electromagnetism it is better to think in terms of charge distributions. I have a charge distribution which is not changing with time, and I want to know what is the potential energy of the charge distribution. 
that would be rho at x rho at y upon mod x minus y integral over d3x d3y that is what we have got m equals 0 limit of this right so uh, what i am not getting is how is this related to any kind of ground state to ground state amplitude or anything like that well not not in any obvious way but what is that that is the whole point what i am trying to tell you is that what we all know as an interaction energy of a static source what does it do in the quantum field theoretic context? Suppose you have two sources and there is an interaction potential energy between the two sources. Now we know that the sources, if it has been, think of the static limit as a slowing down of the time dependence. So when they are time dependent, we know that they are going to produce particles. And these particles emitted by the same source can be absorbed later on by, we, we never did J1 and J2 except in the initial stages. So it is just the same G which is acting as a source and as a sink. And there is a propagator in between. What it does is to modify the vacuum to vacuum transition amplitude. As long as J has a time dependence, it is easy to understand. We say that, well, it is producing particles and it is destroying particles. So it should say something about vacuum to vacuum amplitude. But when you take the uh, zero omega limit, it still does something to the vacuum to vacuum amplitude. It just changes the phase of that. This is what I illustrated with a harmonic oscillator. Take a harmonic oscillator, couple it to f of t, q of t. Then what will happen is that the time dependent perturbation will make the uh, harmonic oscillator, if you start at the ground state, go to the excited state, the time dependent perturbation. But suppose I say that, no, I am now going to slowly switch off the time dependence and make f a constant. If it is a non-zero constant, it still does something, because we saw that before, right before our eyes, that it shifts the zero energy of the Hamiltonian. The moment you shift the ground state energy of the Hamiltonian, the vacuum state is going to remain the vacuum state, so to speak, but the vacuum energy is going to pick up by E, capital E. That is exactly what we come so the interaction potential energy of the static stores adds to that vacuum energy. Any other comments? Okay. So the other oh, thing sorry. is, uh, so the thing that you clarified in the first thing. So I'm just trying to right. summarize it. So you were saying that even if omega one is the same as omega two, absolutely. Since f will change in between because that's of correct. Index, correct. The a that you uh, infer. Uh, will be okay, different. Will be different. Capital so, beta will not vanish exactly. just because I had a time dependent harmonic oscillator which went from omega 1 to omega 1. Right. right? Because you can easily see right. that when you do the integrals, you will find that beta does not vanish. Yeah, that's what happens. But when omega 1 is same as omega 2, it doesn't make much of a distinction mathematically what wave function you are multiplying by and integrating in order to calculate that C0. Because the wave functions are Hermite polynomials which depends only on omega because m is equal to 1. So they are just functions. They are purely mathematical functions. They are going to be identical. But their physical interpretation is very different. I, mean, I think it's easier to understand isn't that simple picture. Exactly, exactly. That is the whole point because uh, if you mix up and I haven't even mentioned interaction picture. In the interaction picture what we will do is part of it will go into one and part of it will go into another and then only the interacting term of the Hamiltonian will cause the evolution. So that will create still further problem. But it is much easier to understand this whole thing in Heisenberg.